Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, my name is Michelle Obama, and I am an African-American woman. <laughs> On behalf of myself and my husband, it is truly a pleasure and an honor to welcome you all here to Washington. Uh, we have so many distinguished leaders uh, here with us today. Of course, we have President Bush uh, and Mrs. Bush who are here today, and I want to thank them both and the Bush Institute for their passionate leadership on the issues that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, I also want to recognize my dear friend, Dr. Jill Biden, who is here as well. She has been a tremendous partner uh, over the past five and a half years, and I'm thrilled that she is here with us today. And of course, uh, most of all, I wanna thank all of you for joining us at this event. We have a fabulous program lined up for you today, as you've heard. We'll be discussing important issues, we'll be hearing from renowned experts, and we're gonna be making some uh, really exciting announcements about new initiatives across Africa. So this is gonna be a really big day. Um, this has been uh, a day that's been a part of a big week. Uh, that's been a part of a big couple of months, actually. <laughs> As you may know, the summit that your husbands are attending uh, this week is the largest gathering of African leaders ever hosted by an American president. And about six weeks ago, 500 young leaders from across Africa arrived here in the United States to take part in the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders. And I have to tell you that these young men and women are truly extraordinary. Many of them are barely half my age. I don't want to say that, but they're young. <laughs> and they've already founded NGOs. They've started their own businesses. They, they've risen to senior levels of their governments. And as part of the Mandela Fellowship, they have undertaken intensive academic coursework and leadership training at universities across America. And the passion, the intelligence, the dedication of these young leaders has inspired all of us here in the US who have had the pleasure of spending any time with them. I had the privilege of speaking with these fellows last week, and I met with a group of them who share my interest in girls' education. And two of the fellows from that meeting will be doing a presentation today about their stories and their ideas. And I'm not gonna steal any of their thunder because they are remarkable individuals, but I can tell you this, that while we talked about a range of issues, there was one theme we kept returning to. Again and again, these young people emphasized how important it is for them to have support uh, from leaders in their governments. And this is the very same message that I hear so often from the young American leaders that I meet with. These young people are working so hard in their communities. They're facing so many challenges and obstacles, and they're looking to all of us for inspiration. They're looking to us to champion the issues they care about. And most of all, they're looking to us to empower them to be part of the solution. And that means that we all are gonna to need to do everything in our power to bring these young people to the table. We need to spend a lot of time with them, more time listening, and I mean really listening to their voices, to their views, so that we can understand the challenges that they're facing through their eyes. And we need to learn from their experiences and from their expertise. You see, these young people are developing all kinds of new technologies and social media strategies to address problems that our generation hasn't yet solved. And whether it's an app to fight cervical cancer or a new approach to clean energy, they are coming up with solutions that we never could have dreamed of. So the question is, can we and our governments learn from them and follow their lead? Can we embrace their ideas and incorporate them into policies and strategies? And in our work as first ladies, first spouses, can we find new ways to be more inclusive of these young people and show them that we truly value their voices? 
and so many of you are already embracing the young leaders in your countries through your work. Whether it's improving girls' education or fighting cervical cancer or HIV or supporting microfinance, you all have the potential to inspire millions across the globe. So it is my hope that today we will rededicate ourselves to these efforts and commit to new efforts to lift up our young people. And I hope that you all will have a chance today to really connect with each other and learn from each other and hopefully be inspired by each other. And with that, it is now my pleasure to begin a conversation with a First Lady who has long been an inspiration to me. Laura Bush set a high bar for me during her time in the White House, and she has continued to do outstanding work around the world since she and her husband left Washington. And I consider her not just a role model, but also a friend. And I'm thrilled that our conversation today will be moderated by another woman who I greatly respect and admire, one of America's leading journalists, our friend Koki Roberts. And with that, I will have them come out to the stage uh, so that we can begin our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the day. I'm so excited that we get to do this again. Yeah, that was really fun. <laughs> we was, did this last summer. We did in it Dar es Salaam and in Tanzania. And, and Mama, what, uh, uh, thank you so much for that. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience for all of us to be there with you. So thank you for hosting us last year, and thank you for hosting us this year. So here That's we are. Um, but uh, it is. Um, I remember, as I recall, when we were last year, you were still getting blowback about your bangs. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's over. But that's no, an important no. issue. <laughs> Let's see what they say about this one. But, but, <laughs> but the program, you have bangs in the program. I just have to warn right. you. Yeah. And since then, your daughter has turned 16. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, but I have to tell you, I'm envious to anybody who's had a daughter turn 16. Is envious is to have it happen in the White House, where yeah. you, you kind of can keep an eye on We can it. share the experience with the world, <laughs> all, the, all the pain and pleasure that goes but along with it. I remember Lucy Johnson, President Johnson's daughter, saying when she turned 16 in the White House and got a driver's license, she said, it was permission to drive a motor vehicle. That's all it was. <laughs> <laughs> For most people, a driver's license is freedom. That's right, that's right. That's right. Well, but uh, but you experiencing it well, right? Well, the girls are, are, are growing up, and as uh, Laura and the President know, that it is a true testament to the parents to raise wonderful young people through this experience. And we have had some terrific role models. Jenna and Barbara are just amazing young women who are doing extraordinary right. things, not just in this country, but around the globe. And uh, once again, they're setting a high bar, but the girls are doing great. I'm very proud That's of right. them. Right. <laughs> and you have a grandbaby. That's right. A girl. We have our first grandbaby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Our <laughs> darling. <laughs> Our darling little Mila. George and I are just gaga over our baby. <laughs> so How cute. old is she now? She's 16 months. Oh, she's doing real things. Yeah, also she's 16. Just yeah, exactly. 16, 16 months. <laughs> she's doing great. So we just saw that very uh, important video. And uh, Mrs. Obama, you spoke last week to the young African leaders. And you were very strong uh, in your statements about the need for educating girls and treating uh, women uh, and girls with uh, dignity and equality. Why did you choose to do that? Well, it's so often what we find in our positions is that you, can, you have to change attitudes before you can change behaviors. And one of the things I said to the young people that we can talk about the need for more resources as it comes to, uh, when it uh, concerns girls' education, the need for school fees, and the need to improve transportation. But the bottom line is that until uh, men, leaders, women, until we value women and girls, 
uh, we won't tackle those other problems. Until we prioritize our girls and understand that they are as important and their education is as important uh, as, as the education of our, our, our sons, uh, then we will have lots of work to do. And I wanted to Im just implant that notion in the minds of these young leaders because they have to approach their work with a whole new attitude. And one of the things I ask the young men is that you have to be introspective and ask yourselves whether you truly believe that women can be your equal. And in sharing my story, just understanding the power of having men in my life who valued me and put me first and treated me with the re respect and didn't abuse me and didn't talk down to me. I want young men around the world to understand that they have a role to play alongside of women who are fighting for these rights. And I want our young men to understand this at an early age. So. Mrs. Bush, you've been working on this issue for a long time, particularly with the women of Afghanistan. And are you still doing that? Tell us about where you were doing the work. Yes, we're today. still working on that. After September 11th, when the spotlight turned to Afghanistan, and we in the United States looked at the way women in Afghanistan were treated, uh, many, many people, women and men in the U.S. were concerned. And uh, that's when I first started working with women in Afghanistan. And Mrs. Obama is right. Uh, in fact, one person said to me one time, why are you working with women? It's men that have the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, we, we do need to make sure worldwide that all humans are valued, that women and men are valued, that girls and boys are valued, and that human life is valued. I think that's really uh, the most important thing we can do, all of us can do, is try to increase that uh, knowledge worldwide that every life is precious. And of course, on the, this question, the question of girls' education and, and um, women's health and all that, we have so much data now that shows that if you educate a girl, you save a country. You know, so are you, are you finding that you're able to keep working on that, that that's something you're able to, because one of the questions I got um, last year after you all finished talking and I stayed um, for a couple of days from these wonderful women was, you know, how do you keep it going? Well, one of the things we've done, George and I have done, uh, obviously when you live in the White House, you have a platform, but former first ladies and former presidents continue to have a platform and a convening power. And we've tried to do that with the first ladies initiative that we started last summer with the first conference in Dar es Salaam. And that is to bring uh, together first ladies really from around the world. We started with African first ladies, but we're interested in engaging women from every, first ladies from every country, uh, to talk about the very unique platform that the spouses of world leaders have uh, to help the women in their countries, uh, to make sure that everyone is paying attention to the education of boys and girls in their country, and that we're making sure that women have the opportunity to be involved in the economic life of their country. Because only countries where all people are involved can be successful. We, when we look around the world and we see countries where half of the population is marginalized or left out, then we usually see countries that are failing. So it's important to keep talking about that. And, and it's important, as I said in my opening remarks, to make room for the next generation of leaders. Because one of the things that the young people said to me, as I mentioned, is that they, they asked me to ask the first spouses to make room for them. Hmm. Uh, because they're, they're looking for a place at the table. And they specifically said that when you meet with the, the spouses of our country, tell them that we want to help, that we want a voice, and that we're looking to, to them, they're looking to all of us uh, to provide that seat. And that's where that platform that Mrs. Bush speaks of, why it's so important. Because these young people, they believe that, we, that they get their inspiration from us. They're looking to us. They still don't quite know that they have the expertise and the skills already. They think we know more. We but actually do. We, we, we do. <laughs> we do. We do. But, you know, when you listen to just the opening speakers, when you think about social media, right. you know, I mean, just listening to the hashtags and the Twitter accounts, I mean, 
that, that, was, that was a little nutty. <laughs> but it's, it's how you continue the conversation. And globalize and it. And globalize it. And young people are just more adept at that. Right. Um, and they can, you know, as I tease my kids, I tell them, I want them to use Instagram to take a picture of something really important rather than their food. <laughs> You know, but, but young people oh, can be on. a support to exactly. us. You know, I mean, no one really cares what you have for lunch. But. <laughs> well, you both talked last year when we were having this conversation about shining a light mm -hmm. on an issue and that you, you in this unique position, that you have the opportunity to shine the light. At some point, people stop looking at what you're wearing and see what you're, what you're aiming at. One of the questions I get all the time is how do you choose? How do you choose what issue to shine a light on? Now, you knew when you came in that you wanted to do something about military families, but it was kind of inchoate, right? Um, you expected to do something about early childhood That's education right. and cognition, mm -hmm. and of course, circum September 11th changed all of that. Um, how do you put it together to decide exactly what you're going to do? Well, I think you look at yourself and see what your expertise is. When I came to the White House, I was a, had been a librarian. I loved to read. I've been a teacher. And so education and literacy were, were very, very obvious interests of mine and expertise of mine. So that's what I started with. But then also you look at what appears. And uh, there are ways you can take advantage of uh, different things that happened to go in another way. I got a phone call, uh, for instance, from the head of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute here in Washington. And she said, did you know that heart disease is the leading cause of death among American women? And I didn't know that. I just had assumed cancer was the leading cause of death among American women. But so I knew if I didn't know that heart disease was the leading cause of death, that many American women didn't know that either. And so I was presented with the opportunity to talk about the heart truth and to get the word out to American women that heart disease was a leading cause of death so that they could start doing things because heart disease is often preventable. But also, if you know that you might have a heart attack, it wouldn't just be your husband that had a heart attack, then you can rush to the hospital yourself and get the kind of treatment that you would demand for your husband, uh, but you might not realize you would need it yourself. So I think they're both ways, both look to your own expertise and then just take advantage of other interests that come up and uh, uh, see if you can make a difference in your countries. Uh, also, where, you, where your passions lie, um, because I found that uh, I've been most effective when I am uniquely authentic. There's a sort of, there, there's a, authenticity to what I say. Um, so that means I have to really believe passionately in the causes that I take on. Um, and, and, and that lends itself to more power, more effectiveness. It just makes you a better advocate because this is something you care deeply about. This was true when it, comes, it came to the issue of, of uh, educating our young people. I just started an initiative this year, Reach Higher, because one of the things I'm deeply passionate about is the role that education has to play in the lives of our young people. And I, my story is the story that I try to share with young people to motivate them. You know, there's nothing in my life that would <laughs> indicate that I would be sitting here on this stage with a former first lady and one of the, mo the most renowned journalists and every first spouse in Africa. <laughs> nothing in my, my life indicated that, but <laughs> my parents believed in the value of education, even though they were not educated themselves. And they pushed my brother and I to do the best that we could do. Um, so what I want young people in America to understand is that we are blessed in this country to have public education, uh, to have opportunities that many girls around the world are putting their lives at risk to achieve. So it's incumbent upon us here in America to take advantage of every opportunity and young people have to own their education. I can do that because I believe it. It is my story. It is you know, mm -hmm. why I'm sitting here. Mm -hmm. um, and my hope is that I can, I can start a national conversation about reigniting that hunger for education in our young people and using that to talk about the issues that our, our girls around the world are facing with 60 million girls today not in school. Right. 
30 million of those in Sub-Saharan Africa. I want our young people across the globe to be talking about how do we fix that. Um, so uh, that's just an example. That I'm clearly passionate about that. <laughs> But one of the things that we're gonna to do today in the various panels is, is how to, essentially. Um, and you all have done the how to. And part of that is a private uh, public partnerships. And, um, and on all of your initiatives, it seems to me that you've both done that, that you've brought in um, universities, companies, foundations, uh, whatever combination of things works. Um, I, can you talk about it, for instance, with Helping America's Youth? Sure. Um, Helping America's Youth was one of my initiatives, and I traveled around the country and had summits, actually, conferences in many parts of the United States with all of the youth serving um, agencies, types of agencies, from individual foundations that people had to individuals themselves, two men, for instance, who use sports uh, to teach character. Uh, building in Seattle and worked with uh, sports groups because they knew they could attract boys and then they attracted their mothers <laughs> there because their mothers would bring the boys to their sports practices so they would uh, talk about sportsmanship in a way that really talked about life and the way that people can uh, use all the uh, characteristics of a good sport uh, to also be a good person. But what they discovered then was that their mothers were, in many cases, single mothers. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a community really of their own. And so they started, after the sports games, they would have barbecues. So the mothers could meet each other and be with each other. And, and really, they uh, were the, out to help the boys, uh, but found out they helped the whole family uh, with this one, one um, agency or one uh, foundation that these two men started. And that's just one example of many, many others that were part of helping America's youth. And, and helping people get off of drugs or not get into drugs, that's not right. get into, and it seems to me in some ways you've built, built on that uh, with Let's Move. Mm -hmm. I mean that it is, um, it is being preventatively healthy mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> all along. So to talk, to talk to us a little bit about how you've put that together. Mm, yeah, well, yeah, for those of you who don't know, Let's Move is my initiative to uh, end childhood obesity in a generation. Um, and we have really relied greatly on public-private partnerships because what we all have to understand is government has limits. Um, limited resources, limited, you know, base of power. People look to government and think that government can do everything, but many of the solutions that we're trying to um, achieve require uh, the involvement of the nonprofit sector and the private sector. Um, so we've really enlisted uh, uh, companies to market food differently to kids so that they are not marketing unhealthy products. Um, we've enlisted uh, sports organizations to uh, get kids up and moving, uh, try to invest in, in more sports in communities that are underserved, whether it's the U U.S. Tennis Association or the, um, the the NBA or what have you. Many of these private players have been very eager to step up and partner with us to achieve this goal because we all have an interest in making sure that the next generation is as healthy as possible. Uh, we spend billions of dollars in uh, covering obesity-related illnesses, and all of these illnesses are completely preventable with good diet, nutrition, exercise. So what we have said to many of our partners is that we all have an interest in this, and there's a way that we can uh, all do well by doing good. Um, you know, we can, companies can still be profitable by creating foods and educating parents and families to help them make better choices about what they feed their kids. I must say, with, with teenage daughters, though, it must be, um, uh, I would suspect that sometimes they say to you, let's move, Mom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you've been sitting at our dining room table, <laughs> Koki, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, every teenager is, has a little smart aleck in them, it's true. They, but, you know, but one of the things we found in our household is that kids listen. 
You know, they, they take on these new messages even when we don't think they're paying attention. And that's one of the things that we try to tell uh, parents is that they don't, you don't know that they're listening, but I see how my children make different decisions about what they eat now as teenagers now that they have a control because they have the information about how food affects uh, their overall health and their ability to perform. But it's our job to uh, empower parents and families to make the choices that are best for them. Uh, You've gotten some blowback for it, um, which, which is some it's way is surprising. Don't yeah. worry, you get blowback for everything. Well, that was about I just don't know. a good deed. <laughs> <laughs> that was just where I was headed. <laughs> um, I mean, it is. I know that you, you know, you, you both get into these things, and and you. You're doing them to, for the good of the country, and, and suddenly you get criticized for it, and it must just be such a shock in a way. I mean. I know, well, I was not that shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we had somebody that lived in the White House that we watched very closely, right, that we right. loved, <laughs> President Bush and Barbara Bush, and so I was very aware when George ran for president that, you know, that you're always going to be characterized in a way that you aren't really. And uh, so I don't think it was any big surprise uh, to me. That doesn't make it any less hurtful. Uh, but, but on the other hand, I think anyone who's in a leadership position of any sort knows that you're going to be criticized and a target really for criticism. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely true. And that's uh, really the, the role of, of leadership. You know, it's not about amassing power. It's uh, taking some of those hits in the, you know, and, and continuing to do the work, uh, even when it's painful and sometimes unappreciated. Um, but that's why it's important for all of us to have a vision, you know, as first spouses. Because if you have your vision and you know what you're passionate about uh, and you know what direction you're going in, then all of the the arrows and the spears and the criticisms, they just, they bounce off of you because you keep doing the work every day. And well, they might pinch a, they little, might pinch a little bit, <laughs> you know, you might get shot in the eye, you know, you just sort of go to the doctor, pat yourself up and right. get back in the game. Well, I think that's an important <laughs> message for people to hear because it's hard to do what you all are doing. And you talked about, um, you know, it's not about amassing power. It's certainly not for the spouses. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, this, it's it's not being in that role, mm -hmm. and still you get the criticism. So it's important to say that you can live through it. <laughs> well, and everyone um, comes to the, these positions with different temperaments, you know. And you know, I watching Mrs. Bush, um, you know, she has been able to traverse all of this with a level of grace and kindness <laughs> and compassion. You know, just seeing how uh, our transition worked, and we talked about this in Tanzania, that it, um, people are who they are. I said this in my convention speech about the president. Um, being president doesn't change who you are, it reveals who you are, and that's true for first spouses as well. Um, you come to this with a temperament. You know, some people are shy and never want the limelight. Other people are much more outgoing and, uh, it may be a bit more aggressive and able to withstand the heat of the spotlight that shines on us. Um, but I, I think that all of us, we have to bring what is uniquely us to the table and work within that. Um, and that's sometimes what you know people around the world don't understand. First spouses, we don't choose this position. We just happen <laughs> to be in it. We're elected and we do by the, one we're, man. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't be fired. Can't be fired. I <laughs> certainly hope not. <laughs> well, I guess we'll see. <laughs> um, well, you know, one of the things that is unique is, is your voice as women. And you both talked about that last year. I went back and looked at You were both quite eloquent about um, how important it is to, for women to use your voices and your power. And um, I think, Mrs. Obama, you said, we're not complicated, but we're complex. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's a good way of putting it. And, but, but again, Mrs. Bush, why is it important for, women to, for women's voices in this particular position to be heard? For the First Lady? Well, I think it's important because the First Lady has an opportunity, really, to talk about uh, what is most interesting to her and what she thinks she can help, the way she thinks she can help her country and the people in her country. 
uh, the best. I loved a quote, Lady Bird Johnson, who said, the first lady has a podium and she intended to use it. And she did. Uh, she was another Texas first lady and I admired her from a distance. I didn't know her then, but got to know her later when George was governor and we lived in Austin. Uh, but she really did. She used what she loved, and she happened to love the na uh, native flowers and the natural beauty of our country, and she made a huge difference. The well, daffodils that you start. see blooming here along the uh, um, George Washington Parkway she were planted because of Lady Bird Johnson. But yes, yeah, she used education and civil rights, and she was a Southern uh, uh, First Lady, so it was very important for her to speak out about civil rights, and she did. She campaigned all across the South for the civil rights laws that were passed and signed during President Johnson's administration. Well, I, you know, I, once again, I always go back to young people. Mm -hmm. You know, we meet, I know I do, we meet thousands of just wonderful young people in our countries and around the world. And, you know, to, to walk, to have a seven-year-old, a 12-year-old walk up to you or send you a letter and tell them, thank you for what you do, I look up to you, you inspire me. You know, that reminds us all that whether we like it or not, we are role models. Um, and as women, we have the, the young girls in our worlds, in our countries, they're looking to us. They're looking to us for how we should be, how we should think, how to use our voices. And as a result, we have a responsibility to show them the way in whatever way we can. And that may be something as simple as embracing a child on the line and telling them that they're beautiful and that you're proud of them and that you know that they're important and they're valued. I think about that because every time I meet a child, I think who knows what's going on in her life, whether she just bullied or whether she had a bad day at school or whether she lost a parent. That interaction that we have with that individual, that child for that moment could change their life. Um, so we can't waste the spotlight. Uh, it is temporary um, and life is short uh, and change is needed and women are smarter than men. <laughs> well, there is that. <laughs> that. That just goes without saying, but. Um, <laughs> and the men can't complain because you're outnumbered today. <laughs> but Mrs. Bush, you talked, you've talked about that before too, that it's a temporary spotlight, but you are now working hard to carry it on. And, um, and I think that sense of continuity is very important. Um, so you have the, um, the George W. Bush uh, First Ladies Initiative, you have the Global Women's Initiative, the Women of Afghanistan, you're, you're, you're keeping going. We are continuing to work, both George and I are, through the uh, George Bush Institute, which is in Dallas now at the Bush Library and Museum. Um, and it gives both of us a chance to keep working on the issues that were the most important to us. Pink ribbon, red ribbon, is our global health initiative. Many of you already know about that. We've launched in uh, three countries in Africa and we're gonna hear about some more in a few minutes. But uh, because PEPFAR was started while George was president, the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, uh, we wanted to be able to continue a global health initi initiative that builds on PEPFAR. And when we looked at the cancer numbers across Africa and really across the world and saw that cervical cancer, which is preventable, is the leading cause of cancer death among African women, uh, we figured out there was a way we could use the PEPFAR platform that's already established and add the testing and treatment for cervical and breast cancer uh, to PEPFAR. And so that's our global health initiative. It's given us a way to keep building. And we have a number of terrific partners who are in the room. Um, so thank you all to all the partners. And thanks to the first ladies in the countries where we've already launched and where we're getting ready to launch. I, I just thought that was such a smart initiative because it really does combine uh, so many elements that are just sensible, mm -hmm. you know, which is another thing women are good at. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the fact is, is that you, you had the PEPFAR clinics, so you, the women were already coming in, and, but you needed 
since, since uh, uh, breast cancer isn't caused by uh, the yeah. same diseases, you needed to get um, somebody else in. So you got Susan G. Komen and That's the pharmaceutical right. companies mm -hmm. in. And it's really now turned out to be a total women's health platform. It is, really. And it's partnering, obviously, with the U.S. government as well, using the uh, U.S. State Department as our partner because we are using the PEPFAR platform to add and the great news is that cervical cancer really can be treated, not when it's advanced, which is why it's so important that women come to be screened early on and uh, then be treated. And then the vaccination programs with the HPV uh, vaccination is important. And many, I think many African first ladies, ladies are trying now to manage these uh, vaccination programs so that there we really won't even have to worry about cervical cancer when these girls who are vaccinated grow up. And do you think about that, Mrs. Obama? I know you're still right in the middle of it. <laughs> I hope you're not thinking about that yet. <laughs> oh, no, not at all, not at all. <laughs> but about how you can carry on some of these, and talk about some of your other initiatives, too, mm -hmm, while you're doing mm -hmm. it, because you have done yeah, yeah. these private uh, yeah, public well, partnerships, particularly around the military families. Well, Dr. Biden and I, we started joining forces, which is a, a, a nationwide effort to provide the su support, respect to our men and women in uniform and their families. Uh, we have uh, worked with private companies to create jobs as these men and women transition to civilian life, you know, working on making sure they get the education benefits, uh, all the support that they they should expect, having put their lives on, line, on the line and their, their, their families' lives on hold. Um, and the medical schools, you're working with medical schools? Well, the nurses are uh, becoming trained to be able to identify and support uh, men and women who may have post-traumatic stress disorder, um, just educating the entire country on what PTSD means, trying to destigmatize it so that you know these men and women feel uh, like they can seek help when they need it. Um, all of that has been, um, you know, it, it is a passion for both Jill and I. Uh, Jill is a Blue Star mom, uh, and she proudly says that. She has grandchildren who she's seen grow up while her son, Bo, uh, was deployed. Uh, so it's truly a passion for her and for me. This is something that I'm going to do long after we leave the White House, because these needs will always be there. And as I, I've been able to see through former first spouses and, and former presidents that the platform is, it, it continues. Um, and that's something that I would encourage all of, of you to think about as well as, you know, how do you uh, sort of lay the foundation for the legacy that you want to create for yourselves? And I think as women, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about our legacies. Uh -huh. You know, what we want to leave behind in the work that we do. Yes, there are so many important symbolic responsibilities that we have in our roles, but there is nothing wrong with thinking about legacy and what we want to leave for the world. Um, uh, but that takes planning, it takes coordination, um, it takes partnerships. And I don't think that we should be afraid as women to, to have those conversations. Right. It's too soon for me to do it now. <laughs> But uh, the time will come, and, and I will embrace that, because what I've seen from the Bush family is that there is a level of freedom that also comes after you're out of this spotlight. It's a new spotlight. It's a different spotlight. But there, you know, I think that there is more that you're able to do outside of office oftentimes that you can do when you're in office. Except you can, don't have the same. I remember you saying at one point, Mrs. Bush, you know, you could pick up the phone and call a member of Congress and get something done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I also just want to come back because we are at an African summit. And both of you have exhibited such a strong interest in Africa. And I think uh, you have very much helped to shine a spotlight on the continent and, and caused us all to learn a great deal more about the good news. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's going on in Africa. But um, I'm kind of wondering how you got there. I mean, Mrs. Bush, I know you were in 75 countries when you were First Lady, which is a lot. Um, but, um, but why Africa? Well, obviously, it started with PEPFAR. When um, George launched PEPFAR in 2003, remember what it was like. It was people were dying every single day 
all across Africa. It was a huge pandemic that was gonna leave a continent of orphans uh, if no one uh, did anything about it. And so George saw that it was really important for the United States to be actively involved in, in uh, helping in Africa. It was so important for us as the wealthiest country in the world, uh, to, both because we could, but also because we should uh, morally. Uh, try to save as many lives as possible. So I went on that trip with George in 2003 when PEPFAR was launched, and our daughter Barbara was with us as well, and she has really made her life choices uh, because of that trip. She's now uh, the head of Global Health Corps. She in engages young people from every part of the world uh, to serve in the right? health. She created Global Health Corps, founded it, to um, engage young people to work in the health field, and she has Global Health Corps Fellows in Africa and also here in the United States. Uh, but I think because of that first trip and because of PEPFAR, we uh, just got a huge interest in Africa and, and traveled there many times, and of course have traveled there many times since we've been home. We just had a wonderful trip this last March, a private trip, uh, not a uh, business trip mm -hmm. to Ethiopia to visit the Christian sites in Ethiopia. And, um, so Africa has become a very important continent to us, partly because of that, because of PEPFAR, but just also because of our experiences there. Well, and Africa is an important continent to the rest of the world. Um, its success uh, uh, is integral to success, the, su the success of this nation, the United States, and the world. Um, and it is an undervalued, under uh, underappreciated uh, uh, continent. Um, so it is incumbent upon uh, the world to have a better understanding of what Africa has to offer. Um, the importance of Africa is very personal to me uh, because as the president said last night in his toast, um, you know, Africa is home for us. Uh, you know, his family is there. We have relatives there. We have visited the continent on, in, on several occasions. We have taken our daughters back to his uh, grandfather's uh, village, um, and they have seen a part of themselves. Um, so the partnership with this continent means uh, a great deal to us. Um, and we've seen the power, the potential, I mean, to meet these young leaders and to see how, how hungry they are uh, to, to uh, take their countries to a new level, um, that kind of passion is infectious. Um, and it's something that young people here should know and understand. You know, we want people from America to travel to Africa, to understand its languages and its different cultures and not to see it as a monolith. Um, and to truly see the investment opportunities, uh, which is one of the reasons why this summit has been so important, because it hasn't just been a conversation with world leaders, but some of the nation's most powerful businesses are here. Uh, some of the most prestigious nonprofits are here. That's why today's session is so important, um, because our success as a nation is directly tied to, to the success of Africa. Uh, and it's, now it is time for the United States as a whole to embrace that reality. Um, so we, this is the beginning of a, of, of, of a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, but it is, we, are, we are encouraged and we are optimistic. Well, I think this week has been very instructive for, for the whole country. I really do. Um, you know, it, it was wonderful to be in Africa, but to have African leaders here in the United States uh, is educating the country about what is uh, what is going on there, but I am gonna I am gonna end where we began, which is that um, as um, as good as the news is coming out of much of Africa, it won't be as good as it can be until we do more about the girls. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if you all want to just say a finishing word on that subject, and then we will we will continue. Well, let me just thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Michelle, and thank you to President Obama for hosting the African Leaders Summit here, and thank you for inviting the Bush Institute to be a part of the First Ladies Initiative. Thank you for coming to our First Ladies Conference last summer as well, and, and thanks to all the First Ladies who have joined us. Thank you for the great work you're already doing and your 
countries, which we'll hear about in a few minutes. And thank you for all the good work you will do. Thanks, Scott. Well, again, absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you, back at you. <laughs> but Laura, no, abs absolutely. This, we, we are here today because of the, uh, the uh, example that was set in Tanzania through the summit uh, that the Bush Institute organized. And as my chief of staff stated, that when this summit was being organized, we jumped at the chance to do something similar and to continue this conversation and to come together as first spouses and to continue to be inspired by each other. Um, what I would say um, just in closing is that um, uh, we have to fight for our girls. Um, there should never be a girl in this world uh, who has to fear getting educated. Uh, that should be something that is intolerable to all of us. Um, I can only think of my own girls, and I think we all have to see our daughters in these young girls. Um, uh, we want the best for our daughters. We want them to be smart and empowered and loved. We want them to be healthy. We want them to be mentally sound. Uh, and if it's good enough for our girls, it's good enough for every single girl in the world. Uh, but it's going to take leadership like us, women like us, speaking up um, in our countries uh, and making sure that young girls are not subject to abuse and that they are loved and valued. Um, and until we do that, um, we will not solve these problems. Uh, investing in our women, the, the people who raise our children, <laughs> the people who you know take care of families, they have to be healthy and whole. Um, and that is the most important work that we do, whether we talk about clean energy or economic empowerment. Until we start to value women and girls, uh, we will continue to struggle on this planet. Uh, but I have high hopes when I look around this room that we won't tolerate that, uh, not anywhere on the planet. Uh, and if we continue to work together and uh, continue to lift up our young people who are fighting for a better future, then I think uh, we, uh, we will uh, see some progress on these issues. So I look forward to working with all of you in the, the years ahead. So thank you all, and I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Koki, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you as well. <laughs> Thank you both so much for the work you're doing, first of all, uh, for coming together. I keep saying, you set such a good example for the men. <laughs> but, um, but also for allowing me to participate in this conversation. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.